Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Healthy Revolution Conference 2014. I'm Pilar Gerasimo, founding editor at Experience Life magazine, and also founder of RevolutionaryAct.com. And I am so delighted today to have as our guest Congressman Tim Ryan. Uh, he represents Ohio's Northeast District, and he is a really cool guy. He's also a, an accomplished author. He's written two books. One called A Mindful Nation, and I think we talked to him about that book last time we did this conference. But this year, he's got a new book out called A New, the, I'm sorry, The Real Food Revolution. I don't have the book here with me today because I left my advanced copy on my bedside table at home. It is a terrific book, and I um, would always be happy to talk to Congressman Ryan, but I'm particularly excited to talk to him about this topic, which is one so near and dear to my heart. The full title of his book is The Real Food Revolution, Healthy Eating, Green Groceries, and the Return of the American Family Farm. And as a farm girl myself, I appreciated that shout out on the importance of farms to our food supply and health and wellness. So welcome to our conference, Congressman Ryan. Always great to be with you, Pilar. Thank you so much. And I know how busy you are. We have a little bit of your time today, and I want to launch right into a series of questions. The first one is that you really uh, thank you for sharing so beautifully in the, your book about your own story and the food revolution, the personal revolution that you went through that sort of led you here. I wonder if you could just sort of share a brief summary of that experience when you started kind of getting your head around uh, the food revolution for yourself. Well, you know, like most people, you know, uh, you go in and out of these phases of your life where you try to lose weight, you try to eat better, you try to eliminate this or that. And I grew up growing up, I played a lot of sports, so I was very much into what I had to eat and how I had to work out and all of that and maintain some of that. Um, but then, you know, as you get a little older, <laughs> um, you know, things start uh, shifting and, uh, and you, you, you get a little more concerned about your health. Um, and then, you know, I was, was going to get married and, and uh, have two beautiful stepkids come into my life and plans to have another baby. And so it, it became a little bit more uh, of a priority for me to look and see what I was doing. Uh, and then, so I was trying to figure out exactly what I was going to do. And then uh, my wife uh, at the time uh, had celiac disease wow. and, or, you know, we weren't sure exactly what it was, um, but enter our good friend, Mark Har uh, Hyman. And, um, and I started to, through his uh, evaluation and the way he started to take care of my wife's issue with her her gut and her um, the bacteria in her gut and yeast and all of these other things that really opened started to open my eyes really instead of just reading about it but to experience how all these other things play into our health and I knew that and I, I knew stress was a big thing my last book a mindful nation talked a lot about how stress could damage us damage our bodies uh, if we're sick, make us sicker. And if we're not sick, it could make us sick. For sure. And high blood pressure, heart disease, all of these things. So uh, long story short, um, when I saw Mark Hyman's approach and the approach of a functional medicine doctor and their uh, reliance on food and, you know, mineral deficiencies and all of these things, to me that signaled, hey, there's another way to address these health care issues that we're having this national conversation about. Yeah, it's interesting how it all intersects, you know, and, and we'll talk more about that. But I remember I, I met you through our mutual friend, Dr. Mark Hyman, and I was so struck by your willingness to reach out into a progressive healthcare care approach. Um, Dr. Hyman, of course, is uh, a, one of the pioneers of functional medicine, which is a really interesting way of looking at human health and the root causes of disease and dealing with those root causes. And when I met your wife, I remember that she was really struggling with a, a series, a complex series of problems, um, many of which could have been treated by, uh, you know, symptom suppressing means. Here's a cream for that rash. Here's a thing that you can take that will make your stomach pain temporarily maybe diminish. But, um, you know, I was amazed that to see both of you there and just really open-mindedly going, what can we do? Then to see you execute on this plan and really dramatically change the way that you were both eating, which is a challenging thing to do, let's face it. I mean, you've written a book on a revolution, and it is a revolution because it is flying in the face of the way that we've been told to eat and the way that our culture supports our eating for many years. What were some of the first changes that you found to be significant in 
and their effect as you began changing the way you eat personally and as you were eating as a family? Well, for us, you know, personally, I think it was the processed food. Um, and, and, and I'm not here to say we're perfect and my family's perfect. We still cheat, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's important just to, just to throw it out there. I mean, you know, I, there's nothing worse than someone that like a hundred percent of the time you've got to be perfect or you're a bad person. And it's just one more club to bang over your head of something that you're not doing right in life. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we cheat and we have sweets and, you know, but we try now more and more to really eliminate a lot of the processed food. I, I came up with a thing the other day, my stepdaughter Bella wanted some sweets for um, school, for her lunch uh, program. So I came up with this phrase that if you bake it, you can take it. <laughs> so nice. if she bakes it herself, then she can take it. And that does eliminate a lot of <laughs> her wanting to take sweets in the schools. But if she does, it's a, it's a little more homemade. It's a little better for you oh yeah but um we we started to really try to eliminate i started really trying to eliminate the processed foods uh you know the, a lot of carbs too that was kind of the first few steps that we started to make and try to eat whole foods fresh foods fruits and vegetables lean meats um and and really be careful on on the sweet side that's a huge, I mean, it, it changes so many things about your energy, too, and some of the counsel that we give in Experience Life magazine is really consistent with that, that the emphasis needs to be on eating mostly whole foods most of the time, and there's room. You know, we say in the, the 101 Revolutionary Ways to Be Healthy, one of the ways is, you know, basically you can't be perfect, aim for 85%, but yeah. in the, yeah, in that 85% of the time, if you're eating whole foods and you're avoiding some of the more, like, starchy, refined carbohydrates in particular, Boy, right. that can make an incredible difference. And, you know, it's interesting, too, as people begin, I don't know, I don't remember if either one of you had any food intolerances, um, but I think that that's another one that can make a big difference is people stopping eating things that are just personally driving their bodies crazy. Well, and it's about paying attention, you know, and that, and this is kind of how I went from writing a book about meditation, mindfulness meditation to food, because it really is about paying attention. Yeah. You know, what happens to your body when you have dairy or what happens to your body when you have this or that and start to recognize that you may have an issue. You shouldn't just feel bad. And I'll tell you what works. Um, and we've done it twice. And my wife's uh, going to start it for the second time, but I've done it twice is, is Dr. Hyman's um, 10 day detox. Yeah. Because it, it eliminates caffeine and alcohol and, and sugar and sweets and all of these things that, you know, we may have uh, throughout the course of a week. But what it helps you do is it raises your awareness. It calms you down because you're not having caffeine and sugar. So your mind calms down um, and your body relaxes because it's not getting amped up. But what I really noticed is I recognize, you know, what I'm putting into my body and how it makes me feel. So if you have some issues like a, taking 10 days and sucking it up and just like just grinding it out, because you know, that's what it's going to take, a lot of mental toughness to do it. But you will begin to see these things in your life, and you'll notice your taste buds come back. You know, you'll yeah. notice, like, okay, now you're eating fruits and vegetables, and all of a sudden the fruits and the vegetables have so much more taste. Amazing. Your, your palate is not, you know, and I don't really say palate. I'm from Youngstown, Ohio, but your taste buds. <laughs> um, your palate. <laughs> I've learned that word. Writing a book about food, I've learned the word palate. Yeah. But you, you, you know, your taste buds, um, because of so much salt and sugar that you put on them, you can really become desensitized to really what real food tastes like. Yeah. And I think that's another real benefit, too. You know, it's like you're describing a wake-up experience, um, Tim, and I think that that's something that any of us who've been on this journey for a while, we most of us remember that first time we had an experience of doing an elimination diet or just getting off something that we knew we were um, sensitive to and feeling like it didn't just transform our physical health, it transformed our mindset. And, you know, I know in both of your books, much of what you're calling for is a kind of a wake-up, a revolution moment, a shift in perception, but also this shift in daily behavior that sometimes seems like the most challenging thing is one thing to go, yeah, 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 I should be, I should be, right? Shoulding, I should eat more of this and less of that. But when it comes down to like, how do you do this in the face of, um, you know, obstacles 
this stuff is not easy to find. Whole foods are much harder to find than, say, at the corner store, than processed ones. Um, taking time to cook things. I love your idea with you, with Bella of, you know, if you bake it, you can take it, or whatever that was. Um, because these are not now conventions in our society anymore, making your own food, eating whole foods. How have you managed in your own very busy life, uh, you know, as an author, as a congressman, as a parent, to do this in, in an on-the-go way, like if you're traveling and you're, you know, in your office in Washington D.C. and in meetings all the time, what's working for you? Almonds. <laughs> One word. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think keeping things handy, like almonds that that you can ha have in your pocket. And I got this from Mark. You know, you know, you just keep them in your pocket and. And chew on a few here or there so you're not starving. I think that's when you really get into trouble is when you're starving. Yeah. Um, you know, and trying to get something. It's, it's hard when you travel. It really, really is. And my wife and I have this conversation all the time. Um, you know, I think you got to take some vitamins and some fish oil. Like, that's what I do just because you got to keep your energy level up. If you're not able to always eat, you want to make sure you're at least getting some your vitamins but you got to plan ahead. So I'd say like sardines and almonds have been very good and key to me. I'm kind of trying to keep on track when I'm away from home and you eat out a lot. And you just, I think you just got to get into the habit of, you know, where's the lean meat, where's the non-starchy uh, vegetables. And, you know, I, I'm, I gr grew up eating desserts and like trying to like cut those out of after a meal you know, my, my big line has always been, if we're a group of four or five of us, like, well, let's just get something and split it, you know? <laughs> like, you can't just say no, I'll just take a bite or two, and right. it always ends up more than that. And and really getting disciplined to try to, like, cut those little things out. Like I said, like, it's not, it doesn't have to be a wholesale change, but if you just eliminated desserts four or five nights a week, yeah. you know, if you just eliminated... You know, I, I, I always used to put honey in my coffee. And and uh, this was what my old uh, aunt, great aunt Rosie taught, she used to put honey in her coffee. That's great because it's, it's good for you in, in some sense. But first thing in the morning to have coffee with a couple spoons of honey Sugar in it rush. and have two cups of coffee with four yeah. scoops of honey in it. And then wonder why you can't get rid of your belly fat or you're a little <laughs> bit more inflamed. You know, because you're shooting your, your blood sugar levels so high first thing in the morning. So I eliminated the honey. I still drink my coffee. I try to put like an organic, you know, a, no hormone like creamer in it and less than I normally did. You know, so little things like that, I think to me is, is how to do it. That's great. So, you know, there's the personal revolution part, and then there's the reality of the political and social and uh, organizational shifts that we need to make. And I want to talk to you a little bit about a phenomenon that I think is emerging. Um, I talk about is the ride, the rise of food movements, you know, and I think that's really what you're describing in your book. Yeah. Is, is what goes on underneath those daily choices, what are the influencers in our society, in the available food supply? There was a, um, a great way that you described this, and I don't know if I can get it exactly right, but about the problem with food, that there's sort of incentives for us to eat poorly, you know, that our system is set up, the tax system is set up to incent us to eat not so great foods, then we get sick, then healthcare costs go through the roof. We aren't as productive. Our kids don't have as many chances, life chances in school because they have behavior problems and health problems. And then there's a sort of social justice problem of a whole fleet of people who never get the opportunity to excel in school or in their jobs who then end up kind of pushed down. And then we see the cost of that in, in our communities, in incarceration, in all of these other things. And you start to realize you frame this in such a great way, it, but where do you begin to unhinge that? You know, your book obviously talks about things, but in your mind, what are some of the most important elements of this shift, the food movements that you see at play? Well, I think for people to recognize that you have to be involved in the political process. I mean, it, and again, it's, it's easy to say all those bad guys in Washington, D.C., or all those bad guys in Columbus, Ohio, or you know, whatever the state of capital is, and I'm going to stay on my yoga mat, and I'm going to eat my whole foods, and I'm going to go to the community garden, and, you know, everything else is worried about by somebody else. You've got to engage in the process, because you, you laid it out. Yeah. We subsidize, 
current uh, ag system and allow and incentivize people to grow huge row crops where much of the uh, food doesn't go directly to a farmer's market or to a local store. It goes to feed animals uh, or has several levels of being processed into yeah. something that will show up you know, in our grocery store. And, and the idea of a real food revolution is that if we're going to really shift this system, we've got to reduce risks for farmers. And farmers are the ally here. They're not the enemy. And so we can't be all oh, those bad farmers. Listen, they, they're doing what they think they have to do, that they're being asked to do by our government, by our society. Yep. And they're following the incentives. And now they have huge pieces of land capital investments, mortgages, kids in school. You can't just say, oh, hey, next year, can you grow peaches instead of grow corn? No, you can't, you can't do that. Not so much. they need to be a part of this process. So, right, we subsidize this food that ends up, or this these crops that end up in processed food. And then people have, over time are getting diabetes, pre-diabetes, all these other issues. And then we subsidize health care, Medicare, Medicaid, and now the Affordable Care Act, we subsidize health care to take people take care of people who are primarily getting sick because of the food they're eating. Right. So to me, whether you're a liberal or a conservative, this is like, this is the way to go. If you're concerned about long-term budget issues, then this is the fundamental issue we need to address. If you're worried about kids eating healthy, this is the fundamental issue. So how do we create incentives? There's risk for farmers to start slowly shifting into the more specialty crops and then create markets around the farm. And I'll give you an example. In Columbus, Ohio, uh, is the Ohio State University, 60,000 students. All around that in central Ohio is farmland. There's a huge market there of 60,000 people. Just a just captive audience. <laughs> let alone, yeah, let alone the, the, the grade schools and elementary schools and high schools, the prisons. There's so much public money being spent just in that region that you could very easily over time create new markets for our farmers who were just a short truck drive away could uh, address the issue of food deserts in our, our inner cities, make sure our young students are getting the kind of healthy food they need, both in our you know younger or early schools, elementary schools, and in our colleges and universities, and in our prisons. I mean, you know, you, you don't want to say we're going to coddle anybody, but if you want someone to reform, now we're noticing that how behavior can shift because of imbalances in your gut bacteria and the way your body hormone balances and everything else. You want to make sure if you're going to rehab somebody, you start with you are what you eat. Yeah. So, and, and I think you can build this whole system out. And so I say we need a, in order to really build the movement out for the long term, we need a garden in every schoolyard. We need a a kitchen in every schoolhouse, and we need a salad bar in every school cafeteria. And teach kids with a new Home Act 2.0 kind of program how to grow food, prepare food, and eat good food. And then you can very easily tie it into the curriculum. I mean, a lot of schools now who have these gardens chop up the vegetables and use it to teach fractions in the math class. It's great. There's a lot of different ways to tie it into science, to math, to botany into all of these other classes that you're going to have to take, yeah. but you let a kid go get his hands dirty. I mean, we got to make school fun again, and I think this is a great way to do it and accomplish what we need. And in some of these schools, I'll make a last point here, um, we need to break down these barriers between this is our education system, this is our health care system, this is our food system, and everything else. We need to make sure we reduce um, those barriers. And one of the issues is the Medicaid program. So many schools have kids that are 80, 90, 100% of the kids in a school district are on Medicaid. Wow. Well, how do we use the Medicaid program to help build out maybe some of these opportunities for prevention with the garden, with the, you know, the kitchen and all of these other things? That is as essential to health care. And so we need to move, and why I, I call this a revolution is because we need to move out of this old way of thinking, say, no, this is the Medicaid program. This is just for when they get really sick. <laughs> and so we'll wait till they get really sick, put them in the Medicaid program, take care of them, because that's what we're going to do is take care of the least among us, as we should. But it's driving up our cost. Why wouldn't we 
make very small investments with public-private partnerships to put these gardens and these programs in our schools, and ultimately you're going to reduce the cost of the Medicaid program, and then you have more money to put into science, technology, engineering, math, the things you're going to grow our economy and all the other things. Oh my gosh, it makes That's perfect sense. That's the revolution sense. in a nutshell. <laughs> I love the revolution. Well, and I think it's so interesting that it really comes back to that same pattern of like, let's address the root cause instead of f focusing on all these different symptoms that are the downstream effects of the upstream this problem. Is, this is the functional medicine for our public policy. I love it. I love that. Well, so there's some interesting um, colliding interests that start to come up at about this point in the conversation. And as a congressman with constituents on both the business community and the consumer community, I'm sure you've seen this. Um, if talk about food movements, the um, Vani Hari, who also known as the food babe, has been making uh, headlines and nightly news, and I think she's been on TV many, many nights of the last week. And it was really interesting. We um, put her on the October cover of our food issue. Uh, the uh, food issue is the October issue of Experience Life. And we had a sense, like many of our cover models, that you know, not everyone loves everything about every person, whether they're a yoga teacher or a doctor or a food uh, advocate. Or but, a politician. Or, <laughs> or say a politician. <laughs> yeah, you know you're going to get controversy then. Um, but we were frankly surprised. We experienced what I believe to be and have evidence to be an, of an astroturfing campaign, which is something that uh, is the appearance of a grassroots campaign that's organized by some agenda special interest that directs an enormous amount of social media traffic to the source of whatever they don't like and bombards them with what looks like a public outcry. You know, you would think that there are a million people who just can't believe how horrible and dangerous this person is. This this scary monster, you know? Yeah. Who are, oh, I mean, it's calling for my resignation and calling for our apologies and we looked into it and found out that the vast majority of the traffic coming to our site was not coming from anywhere near our normal readership base, and they were mostly organized by a few sites whose entire purpose seems to be discredit, Afani Hari, um, and a few other folks that they don't seem to like. So I'm curious, you know, first of all, if you've experienced any kind of pushback that is um, similar, I mean, a kind of an outcry, for example, or if you've observed this or have any thoughts on it as we look at what it means for someone who's asking for change that seems to be in the public interest and as evidenced by her million followers of her own, seems to be making strides in changing the way people think. And she's well liked by a lot of people, clearly not liked by some people. But boy, it looked to me like a lot of the apparent public outcry was in fact being driven by something other than just disinterested individuals on their own accord. Any thoughts? Yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. First and foremost, I think uh, when you are trying to do something like this, you need to just expect to be sabotaged by somebody. <laughs> somebody is going to try to sabotage what you're doing, and you just need to factor that in. And if you really want to let, let loose, you should just say thank you, because that means you are doing something right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, Vandy's doing something right. And I talk about her in, in the book about what she's been able to do with online petitions, really rally, you know, moms and, and others who are interested in, you know, the food dye and Kraft macaroni and cheese or what's in Chipotle or all of these other things to really hold people accountable. And I will say, just expect that and see that as a sign of success. <laughs> And you should see it as a sign of success as well, uh, because that this is what it's going to take in, for a couple of reasons. One is the regulatory part. You know, we're not making the public investments, in my estimation, that we need to make in the Food and Drug Administration totally. and being able to monitor what's in our food. And it's just, it's gotten too big it's gotten for the government to really even regulate it in an era, in an era of where people are making any investment that the government makes is a bad one you yes. know and, and that's where we're at we're in a the, the narrative in america is to not invest in america to <laughs> just cut all of these things that we used to do to make our consumers safe so to fill that void enter the food bank right. and through thousands of people that she hundreds of thousands of people that she can get and a million people that get on her website you are now part of the regulatory process well what's in this food here Right. So the sign of people trying to take everybody out, I think, is really, really a good one. 
And I think what we need to do to combat it from a political standpoint, from a public policy standpoint, is to build, uh, I need to be an ally with, I need to be an ally with people. I need to be an ally with every urban garden, foodie organization, slow food, community garden in Ohio, for example. They need, we need to all be on the same page. We need to all be organized. We need to all vote. We all need to have house parties. We all need to like reach out to our, you know, people who may not, who are interested in these issues. And that needs to become a big voting block because politically, at some point, they're going to try to sabotage me, you yeah. know, and they're going to try to sabotage other politicians that may rise up and, and look like they're, they're going to be able to really have influence. But you can try to do that. But if there are millions and millions of people, consumers, moms saying, I like what Tim Ryan is saying. I think we should have a garden in every school. Yeah. I think Medicaid would be smart for them. To, you know, and their fiscal conservative husband, they say, doesn't that make sense that we do something like that? And and we're not, here's the thing. We're, we got to eat. <laughs> I mean, the, the food's not going to go away. No. We don't want the farmers to go away. We so just are saying, how do we shift the system so that they can, I'm still for giving them money to make, it's, it's hard to be a farmer. They need some protection from the ups and downs of weather, climate, especially now with global warming and everything else that's right. going on, we need to make sure that we protect our farmers so that they can provide food. All we're saying is let's get away from doing now to a more connected, regional, sustainable farming methods. And so I think, and that's why I and very highly about Ohio farmers, part of this process, they're part of the solution. Well, that coalition that not like this that's a political movement so that we can move this ball down the field so we need a level of togetherness for us to be able to pull this off and Vanny really is really one of the leaders as you are Pilar and I mean you guys are doing it and we all need to be together on this and uh, when they come and try to sabotage we say to our people to the soccer mom and you know outside of Columbus Ohio we say why are they so mad about this? Yes. You know, I, I just I tell my kids this all the time. When you when you call them out on something, they get mad. I said, I just want you to know that when you get really mad, that's a sign that you know you're wrong. And amplify that or apply that to uh, what's going on here with the you know, astroturfing that's happening to you. You know they may be in trouble. Yeah. Because moms are moms are on more. Yeah. And, uh, you get the moms of America fired <laughs> up, ready for a movement. You're going to make some serious stuff happen. Yeah, and mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. I've yeah. been married a year and a half. I know that well. Well, it's very interesting. You know, I think that a lot of what I'm seeing is this trend toward more people speaking out in the interests of really what is the public good. Um, and this is true. You know, I, I know Dr. Oz recently has sort of called to account. And he's one of the people who also, along with Oprah, that on all of the sites that have been attacking our site have been like, we're going to bring these people down, these terrible, awful people who are trying to educate Americans about their health and well-being and mindfulness. They're all crazy, woo-woo people. And it's like, you know what, that's fine. It's fine for someone to think that, and if that's their opinion, it's great. Go live with that opinion. But in the meantime, there are millions of people who are getting together and realizing that when they make these changes, their bodies and their lives and their communities change for the better. And those passionate people, the moms and the dads and the principals of the schools who see change in their students, it's very difficult to hold that force back, and I think that is going to be the fuel for the revolution. It is going to be a grassroots movement, and it's going to be led by people who have the courage, I think, like you, Tim, and many of your allies and our colleagues, to get together and give each other some reality. And look at, you know, I look at, too, the people who are the most vocal critics, for the most part, have very little in the way of a body of work that demonstrates that they have a vested interest of any larger group of people in mind. They're not the people who are out on the street feeding the hungry or advocating for the interest of a bunch of other farmers. For example, it's it's really, it feels to me like the anger that you talk about is sort of a self-perpetuating system and the outrage that gets amplified by you know, I think agendaed, organized interests makes it harder and harder for the real public to understand what their real peers are saying. And it can appear as though something is terribly controversial and terribly dangerous. 
they don't want that change to happen. And I think that it's really great to have books like yours come out, you know, both Mindful Nation and Real Food, the um, Real Food Revolution, I think help to help people to get their head around what's really happening at a big level in many sectors of food, of healthcare, of education, of policy. Um, so you've done a really beautiful job of, of explaining that and advocating for it. And I consider you a hero in this space for that reason. So thank you for that. Um, I also just wanted to cover off on the one of the great aspects of the elements of your book is that for all of this sort of lofty description that you and I are talking about, you keep bringing it down to sort of daily activities and choices, whether it's voting or cooking or shopping differently um, and getting your health media probably is part of that too. Each chapter ends with a what you can do section and there are dozens and dozens of really good ideas. But I wonder if you, thinking about our audience of health-motivated people, uh, many of whom are really ready to make change and are making those changes, if there's one specific thing that you think that they could begin doing, say, tomorrow, that would help to ignite and progress the real food revolution that you write about in your book? Uh, I would say follow whatever you get really excited about. You know, if there's an issue, you know, you're in the yoga or you're in the exercise, you're in the food or you're into whatever, and you have, kid, or you have kids or don't have kids, or what are you excited about? And what is the one thing out of all of the, all of the movement that really resonates with you? Yeah. You know, do that. If, if you want to start getting people registered to vote, or, you know, you want to go talk to the local school board about doing things like getting fresh food, uh, fruits and vegetables at the yeah. school. Oh, you know, how do you have a, have a house party and bring eight or 10 key players in your community that, you know, the, and then invite the school board over, find people who are also interested in this. Like I, I, that's why I lay out so many different things and all the different chapters on urban ag, um, you know, building a real strong urban ag movement or in the schools or in the healthcare, like, cause I, I want to just throw it out there and then you figure out what you're excited about because, you know, doing this about something that you're not really interested in isn't much fun at all. Yeah. Obviously you're excited about it. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about all this stuff. And I feel like from my position, I could just help, but find what you really are excited about and just start where you are. So it's very kind of a mindfulness based approach to this is like you're in the present moment, what's coming up inside you, what excites you, follow your bliss kind of thing, and then go and do it and don't be afraid we, this is not a movement that's based on fear this is about yeah. like okay we got to get this done for our kids and our grandkids and and so do it and if it starts with a small house party and getting one of your friends elected the school board or uh state representative so that they can begin down in, in the state level or township trustee or whatever yeah um, working with local food banks do that because you'll be energized and you'll be like a magnet pulling other people in with your own enthusiasm. And uh, you know the old saying is, nothing great happens without enthusiasm. So if you're enthusiastic about a certain aspect of this, go at it, make it happen. That's so great, I love that. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. And I know we're really looking forward to writing about you and your book uh, in an upcoming issue of Experience Life Magazine. I think our March issue will have Dr. Mark Hyman on the cover and you inside. So people wow. can look forward to more progressive, healthy way of life change wisdom from both of you. Um, and in the meantime, you know, folks who want to find out more about the book, uh, where should they go? They, I mean, the book is out uh, middle of October, I believe, and they can find it in their bookstores and read more about your projects. Which site should I send them to? Well, you can go to Amazon and it'll be in all the uh, bookstores. And, uh, you know, we're trying to really use the book as an opportunity to go to other places. You know, I mean, I've got a day job, unfortunately. <laughs> you know? Do you? You have work uh, yeah, you have to do? Which yeah, is part this, but part not this. It's the policy side, and I, I've got to be very careful with how the, the, the two intersect. But, um, you know, grab the book. In the back, we give lots of resources as to where you can go, um, and we can shift people in, in those directions and, uh, and help build this movement out. But thanks for what you're doing, Pilar, to make this happen. This is really... To me, it's been really, really exciting writing the book and meeting, you know, Vanny and meeting, meeting you for that and what Mark, Mark Hyman's doing. 
you think about these people who are going to take down Oprah and they're going to take down Dr. Oz and Pilar. And, you know, you know, if, if we hang together, um, you know, we, we can do uh, great things. And I think it's the old, I think it was Ben Franklin who said, you know, we're either going to hang together or we're going to hang separately. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And we can just, we need to go out and make sure that we, we stay together, we recognize that this is a political movement. You don't have to get into Democrat, Republican, really, because this is an issue that I think can really unite the country because it too. ends up on our plate every single night. We all have dinner. Yeah. So um, everybody loves their kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my, my pleasure. Thank you for, um, thank you for that reflection. That means a lot to me. And I look forward to continue, uh, to, our, to continuing our conversation and hearing more about what happens next in the space of policy and community and business and family and home. Um, so I want to thank you again for taking time, Congressman Ryan, and thank our audience for hanging in there with us and joining us for the Healthy Revolution Conference. We will continue the revolution here and in the magazine, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Thanks so much. Thanks.